All right, so here here's the deal, bro. Okay, he just dropped the, he just dropped the album review for all the dogs. Okay, apparently, um, I, I'm trying to remember, but someone said that he gave her loss a six. Okay, this album, it's not even been out for a week yet. This is better than her loss. Okay, by far, I got it right now as a top four Drake album. Um, and I, and I still got to keep listening to, to, to the shit. Okay. I've heard the album 10 times. All right. At least 10 times through going by his rating. If he gave her loss a six, this has to be a seven or higher. It has to be bro. There's no, there, it has to be. So let's go. Wow. Wow. Hi everyone. Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for a review of this new Drake album for all the dogs. This is a brand new LP from rapper, singer, songwriter, Aubrey Graham, AKA Drake, Toronto's very own. It is his eighth full length LP and it is a follow up to 2021's Certified Lover Boy. And yes, I know he has dropped Honestly Nevermind as well as the 21 Savage collab project since then. But I think this record kind of goes to show that those albums were detours in a sense on For All The Dogs. Drake is really kind of getting back to what makes Drake. Drake. Now, Certified Lover Boy was one of my least favorite Drake projects so far when it came out. Another unnecessarily long project with some of the most preposterous creative lows of Drake's career. And okay, bro. Okay, okay. I'm going to stop him right there. I'm going to just stop right there. I want to just... This is what I want to say for this, for Certified Lover Boy. Okay? <clears throat> Go look at the streaming numbers on Certified Lover Boy, bro. Go fuck, go look how many people listen to this album, bro. If you, it's, if it's so bad, if it's so, whatever he said, a new low creative, if it's all these things, why would people listen to it, bro? And I don't want to hear, oh, dude, it's Drake. That makes no sense, bro. That makes no sense. All right? Please stop this. Please. Please. I don't want to hear this, bro. All right? Oh, dude, numbers mean nothing. Okay, now numbers mean nothing. Oh, okay. So numbers mean nothing, but all I saw was little Travis Scott fanboys all on Twitter for literally a fucking a month straight. All they were doing was spamming numbers that they themselves know were literally manipulated by fucking bundles and, 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 uh, and sneakers, bro. Dude. And I was, I was hoodwinked, all right? I bought the Utopia Air Forces. I opened it up. Dude, the Utopia shit was peeling off. And then I go to look. Oh, wow, that counts as 10 album sales. The fuck? So stop saying, oh, numbers don't matter when it's, we're talking about the biggest numbers, bro. Okay, but for everyone else, the numbers matter, right? Okay. Endless whinging about how lonely it is at the top, stale shots over beef that is years old at this point, and one of his goofiest singles to date, Way Too Sexy, which is just a few shades away from being a Lonely Island song. Now, of course, this record did have its moments here and there. If you're getting 21 tracks from one of the industry's biggest artists, you are gonna have some bangers here and there. But Drake has currently reached a point where he's almost too big to fail, which is a dangerous scenario considering that he might be the music industry's most self-aware artist right now. Not dangerous for Drake, per se, uh, more dangerous dangerous for us because he understands he can do basically anything at this point and it will create engagement. So it doesn't matter if his writing is subpar, it doesn't matter if he riffs his way through an album. And that's great because his writing is not subpar. You show me another rapper right now, a current rapper, you show me someone who, who, uh, who's fucking, uh, writing is on par with Drake. Please show me one person, bro. Show me one person. Let me look at the chat. Why be? Okay, that's all I need to see, bro. Album that barely has any formal songs on it. It doesn't matter if he's instigating beef that's unwarranted. At the end of the day, it's all more money in his pocket. Drake's current stranglehold on the music industry is showing no signs of waning, even with him having just announced a hiatus after this record. And if he does genuinely get some distance from the music industry at this point, I hope it gives him an opportunity for a reset or something. Because for all of this project's novel hype and marketing, uh, plus that poetry book thing. I feel like with Drake- Hey, 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 hold on, bro. Hold on. We're not going to make fun of the poetry book thing, okay? That sits on my coffee table and it's, and it's a good read. 
All right? It's a good read. Book thing. I feel like with Drake here, we're getting another bloated head scratcher that uh, leaves me wondering who exactly is this record intended for, from front to back. Because he seems to be less interested in perfecting a sound and more interested in giving everybody a little bit of something while lacing this record with the kind of stuff that he knows is just going to generate conversation. I mean, you just answered your own question, right? The album is not for one person, it's not for one type of, of uh, consumer. Drake has worldwide fans, okay? Um, and within those fans, they all like different types of Drake songs, okay? You can't please everybody, okay? You can't. You can't. I've, I've learned this from streaming for almost 10 years. I'm, I know Drake has learned this. I'm, I'm surprised that you don't know this, bro, okay? Everyone's going to want something else. If I right now started uh, playing 2K, half my chat would tell me to go fuck myself and leave. They would, bro. Okay? And half of it would enjoy it. It just is what it is, bro. Okay? So when you listen to a Drake album, yes, there's going to be some songs that you... You might not, oh, this is not my type of song. Okay, well, guess what? Jake's got a whole fucking fan base that loves that type of song, bro. It just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not good. Do you get what I'm saying? Blowout features, rhymes that make you wince, shots, callouts, subliminals, and bars that could also be construed as such. And all this is happening while narrativizing about how his success is hard-earned, and all of his ex-lovers are clownish and stupid, like, uh, you know, any given boyfriend in a Taylor Swift song. So, basically, this record is the most Drake thing ever, essentially. And the formula is so clear now, as I don't think Drake is driven to make albums that are good. I think he's driven to make albums that are polarizing. And also difficult to sum up because there's a variety of great and terrible moments on this thing, and uh, none of them are great and terrible in exactly the same way. There's also a bit of theater of the mind going on with this record, too, as there are numerous tracks with long intros, outros, these transitional moments to BARK radio breaks that have uh, various people acting as DJs on this fictional radio station, Snoop Dogg, Sade, which is for sure cool and adds a lot of fun and character to the flow of the record, but at the end of it all, it's the songwriting quality and the writing quality uh, that this record is going to live or die by. Now, I can give this to For All the Dogs. The album does start off pretty strong. You have the opener, Virginia Beach, which may not be a Tuscan leather or a champagne poetry, one of those uh, long, bar-heavy Drake starters where he's got a great flow and vibe going. This track goes in more of an R&B direction, but the sung lines are really well-conceived. They're sticky. Aubrey is absolutely floating on this beat, which is honestly beautiful. The chipmunk vocal samples, the string layers, it's it's entrancing, it's hypnotic, and kind of reminds me of the, the sort of beat Clams Casino would have made for ASAP Rocky or Lil B back in the day. Drake lyrically is also reminiscing about a relationship, a love that uh, actually used to have some substance to it, some life to it. It feels like there's genuinely some focus to this track. And even if there are bars like, you know, put a baby in you, you're a hot mom, I do think it's a good start to the project. There's also Amen that features Tizo Touchdown, who is absolutely wonderful on the intro of this track. His vocal lines, his harmonies are gorgeous, they're luxurious. Luxurious. It is a classy R&B cut with some Thanks. gospel splashes here and there. Drake brings some solid rapping to the table. Thanks. Yes, of course, there are a few eye rolls here and there lyrically. That is to be expected, but vocally, musically, the track is sound. And while I love that Drake is definitely building up some momentum here, we do get a quick nosedive on Calling For You featuring 21 Savage, which, what the hell is this track? You have an intro that lasts forever, super tedious. Drake doesn't really know how to fill it out vocally, and it eventually just kind of goes into this long spoken word uh, rant by some unidentified girl, unidentified to me anyway. She's going on about like a trip and drama and oxtail. 21 Savage's verse at the end of it is utterly average. It's just several different moments and ideas jammed together into something that just is not a song. Following this, we have Fear of Heights, which is a pretty big switch up from Drake. I gotta, I gotta pause it because how can you just call something not a song? This is my problem with this this fucking melon-headed bastard fuck. This is my problem, bro. He's said this exact thing before. Calling a song not a song. But that's okay. You can say that for a Drake thing. A Drake song is somehow not a song because there's a little break in between. But it, like I said, if Kendrick Lamar did this, okay? If Kendrick Lamar did this, 
you would be praising it and calling it fucking revolutionary. You'd be like, dude, oh my, I know it, bro. I know it. And bro, and I'm not even saying that I like that break in the song. I'm not even saying that. But did you, I don't so call it not a song. What the fuck? How can it not be a song? That's what I mean, bro. As it is him doing a rage style track in the vein of Playboy Cardi. You have those buzzing, cycling synths. He is getting really breathy and a little quietly aggressive on his delivery. It's a convincing performance with a sick flow. And it's kind of surprising that Drake jumps into this kind of vibe, especially after such a slow and sleepy intro where he's dropping all of these, you know, uh, the anti and auntie bars that at one point he says that he has to stop because obviously it's a terrible direction and a corny idea, but uh, there has been a lot of talk and theorizing as to whether or not uh, some of these bars are in reference to Rihanna. Either way, though, Drake, I guess he thinks he's Cardi here, but it's still a banger and somehow harder than uh, a lot of what Cardi has put out recently on his Opium label. Don't tell me you're scared little Drake. Don't tell me you're scared little Aubrey. Then Drake is- Yeah, that's, yeah. Fear of Heights is good. Fear of Heights is good. I like Fear of Heights, especially the second half. Is pretty much scratching the same itch on the following track, Daylight. He thinks he's Cardi twice. And honestly, this track's kind of a banger too. Interestingly, toward the end of the song, uh, we get this boom bap style beat switch where his son Adonis is spitting and it's a cute appearance. It's endearing. Adonis carries. We also have a little carrying going on with the following cut first person shooter, which features J. Cole. Cole goes absolutely. Okay. If I hear one more person say carry, bro, this is, this is just excuses people make because they can't explain shit. They just say carry, bro. So J. Cole carried, right? That J. Cole carried. And they're projected to go number one. That's projected to be a number one song. We don't know yet, but it's projected, right? And I looked. Drake is one song away from passing Michael Jackson for most number ones ever. J. Cole has never had a number one song, ever. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm really thinking about this for a second. Who's carrying who, bro? Who is carrying who? Everyone keeps saying carry, bro. So if J. Cole, if J. Cole is doing this, then why is he not making number one songs, bro? If he can just carry you to a number one. Oh, we don't want to. Oh, no, no, no. What's the what's whoa, whoa, whoa. what's the response to that? What's the response to that, bro? Please tell me. Does is J Cole not famous enough? You're gonna try to pull. You're gonna try to say J Cole's not famous enough? This dude just said famous. J Cole is one of the most famous artists in a fucking. What are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? Absolutely off over this kind of sick, moody, grimy beat, talking about how he and Kendrick and Drake are the goats, so on and so forth. Drake's line toward the start of the track about this being as big as the Super Bowl, but it's just two guys playing shit that they made in the studio is pretty funny too. And for sure, it's going to go down as one of the biggest mainstream bangers of the year. Now, surprisingly, with this rage stuff, Drake dips back into this well again with I Don't Give a Fuck, which features Yeet. Another thing about this track that is a big surprise is that it features this. Uh, long, expansive, new age, ambient intro that fire. has uh, some jazz fire. trumpet in there too. It sounds almost like if Julia Holter collaborated with Miles Davis. It's beautiful. It's genuinely it's awe-inspiring. But then uh, suddenly we get this annoying Benny X beat jumping in with um, <laughs> Yeet just going And while I don't mind Yeet and I like this uh, production and I like this vibe, genuinely in certain contexts. I just feel like lyrically this cut is just too dumbed down even for Drake. Plus he feels like a feature on his own song here as again this feels like a yeet beat. Yeet takes up most of the track okay. and if you're gonna do a song with yeet he is a very very uh like no like you know what a yeet song sounds like right? Why would you try to get yeet to do a, a, a different kind of a song? Why wouldn't you do like, this is what doesn't make sense, bro. Obviously, Drake is going to do that style with him, bro. That's his style of music. You're not going to just put Yeet on a random fucking song, bro. 
We at this point we know that Drake could fit into any type of song. We know this. We like we know this now. Okay, this isn't debatable. So what would be the better song? What would be the better song? What would you would you rather hear Yeet on a song where he doesn't fit in, or you put the best artist of all time on on any type of beat? Which one is gonna work better? Please tell me, bro. Please, please tell me. Country, dude. Drake will fuck a country song up, bro. Drake would fuck a country song up. And he already dropped two good rage tracks on the record already. We didn't need a third. Following this, we have 7969 Santa, mm. which um, feels like I'm good listening song. to a Drake dream sequence. The beat is very faint. He's rapping very introspectively and quietly on the song. There are lots of ambient synth patches on the track and these disembodied Chief Keef samples playing very uh, distantly. There are some cringeworthy bars here and there, but I, I just feel like I'm in Drake's mind on this one in a weird way. And, you know, it's not a bad cerebral switch up. Plus, there's this uh, beautiful Tizo touchdown outro on the track. And all this transitions us into the number one track Underrated. featuring SZA, Slime You Out, which admittedly, since I have originally heard it, has grown on me. The vocal lines are strong, the beat is fine, it does the job. SZA's feature on the track is stupendous, and I like that both Drake and SZA bring their own separate narratives to the song so that it creates some tension. The cute series of bars toward the end of the track that reference the months of the year from Drake uh, are fine. Maybe it's because there are elements of the track I enjoy more now, maybe it's because hearing it next to some of the worst material on this record, it's a far superior song. Either way, I think this track is a highlight, which I'm not sure I can say about behind Bahamas Promises, which for sure is bringing back some real old Drake R&B vibes. But all the bars about all the things we could have been and how you fucked up my Bahamas trip just seems so petty and lame. My Bahamas trip, Haley! You ruined my Bahamas trip! It's like... <laughs> How is that what you got from that? Like, that's insane. That is insane, bro. This is what I mean by someone could say the exact same sentence as someone else, but somehow it's perceived different just because it's just funny to, I guess, I guess he thought this was funny. But dude, I want you to really think about this, chat, okay? I want you to really put yourself, think about this, all right? You finally... You finally get some time off from work. You finally get to go relax, right? Let's go to the Bahamas. Finally, dude. What happens when you get there? A girl ruins your time. And I don't know how many of you guys have experience with girls or shit like this happening, bro. Okay? This shit's happened to me. Dude, that will literally fuck up the whole trip. It'll fuck up the whole vibes. It'll fucking ruin your entire time that you got off, bro. Okay? But, again, this album is for the dogs, right? If you're not a dog, you don't know what I'm talking about. You're like, what do you mean? How could that even... You don't even know what I'm saying, bro. And people have this weird thing of like, Oh, dude, it's not for all the dogs. You're talking about girls. Motherfucker, what do you think a dog is? What do you think? Please tell me. What do you think Drake means by a dog, bro? Someone who gets girls. Obviously, it's going to be about fucking girls, bro. You're an obese dog. Yo, hold on, bro. Because I got, because my mods aren't doing shit. Now I got to stop what I'm saying. Get fucking an obese dog. What the fuck even is that, bro? All right, bro. All I'm saying is, you can look at it like, oh, dude, what, your Bahamas ship? Yeah, bro. Yeah. Your Bahamas ship, that shit gets ruined. You're going to be, you're going to feel some type of way, bro. You're going to. I'll tell you this right now. I've been on a trip. I've been away. Shit went down. You know, some shit, you know, I, I'm not going to go into detail. Shit's ruined. Vibes are off. It's over. Fuck this. I, I don't even want to be near you. This shit happens, bro. It happens. It happens, bro. It happens. Anyway, let's go.
The whole track feels more like a R. Kelly style musical rant of, you know, rather than a song, which is kind of funny given the bar later on the record where Drake is uh, uh, allegedly judging uh, someone who he's with for like, you know, bumping R. Kelly in the whip. Things pick up from here though with Tried Our Best, which I think is genuinely a top 10 Drake song. I do wish the straight wow. flight line and the Shakespeare line just wasn't there, but the- Wait, let me hear that again tried our best which i think is genuinely a top 10 drake song i do wish the it's i mean listen this song is great but it's it's crazy to me what he considers like a top 10 song or like a top drake album or a top this it's kind of interesting to think but again you know but yeah this song is amazing like i said before if i didn't hear this leak uh and i wasn't playing it for like a couple months when if i first heard this when i first heard this i was like dude this is amazing um, so I'm mad that it leaked, but it is a great song. It is a great song. Straight flight line and the Shakespeare line just wasn't there. I, sw I swear to God, you think I'm Shakespeare? That's why you always want to play, right? Come on, man. This is a fucking... This is... Dude, come on, bro. This is bad to you? Stop, bro. This is literally... If anyone was able to come up with this, you'd be like, holy fuck. Again, if Kendrick said this, you'd be like, look at this shit. See what I mean? Oh, it's corny for Drake, but for Kendrick, it's not. Okay, bro. But the okay. vocals on this track are so much better than vocals on previous records, not only in terms of performance, but uh, just also in terms of the melodies he's busting out here. It's a good tune, it's a great structure, Drake is seriously in his R&B bag again. Screw the World is a pretty fun interlude. Meanwhile, Drew Picasso brings us yet again another R&B style musical rant, which is where that R. Kelly being bumped in the whip line pops up. Also, moving like Snoopy and Charlie Brown, you trying to dog the kid? Stop. Following this members only featuring Party Next Door narratively. I love how he just skimmed past Drew Picasso when Drew Picasso is literally one of the best songs on the album, top three. He just skimmed past it. You picked out one line, but again, that was a dog line. There were so many. I love that he, that uh, Dre kept referencing dogs and just using it in different ways. That shit was like, that's the artistic part of the album to me is those, those breaks with the radio shit with Snoop Dogg and shit like that, and the random dogs barking at, at random parts. Um, it, it, it felt like, because there were people saying, like, oh, dude, it's random songs. No, it felt cohesive, bro. It felt cohesive like that is a track that seems like Drake just doesn't know what the hell he wants. He's talking about his connections with this girl who he sees as being like, you know, too gangy, too close or good with the guys, I guess. Cause there are so many tracks on this thing where he clearly wants somebody who integrates into his life, integrates into his world, but I guess they can't get too close to the point where you know, they're they're good with his dogs to the point where he might think a bar like, uh, feel like I'm bi cause you're one of the guys. I'm not afraid to say this because of how much I support Drake and, and love Drake and his music and everything. This is this is the worst line of, of Drake's career. It's the worst line I've ever heard. <clears throat> Eyes, girl. But what's even more concerning and sus is the track, What Would Pluto Do? Pluto being the nickname of frequent collaborator and friend Future. And musically, it's a solid R&B tune, sure. But I think we can agree this is not a strong or essential topic. So I left that song feeling very aggravated uh, and then went into all the parties, which at the start has very How are you just skipping past what would Pluto do, bro? What? How? Like, what do you want from a song? Like, this shit is... But nah, bro, yeah, if Kendrick said, well, Pluto do, you'd be like, oh, that's interesting, like, the way he, like, he didn't say future, he said Pluto, like, it's like a, you would, that's what you would do, bro. Pacing a standout appearance from Chief Key where he brings a pretty catchy refrain to the table, but then the track kind of just fizzles out from there, has no ideas to where to go. Drake repeats the same refrain that Chief Keef brought to the table, but with like the beat slowed down, then it just trails off with a terrible shot at the weekend for no reason whatsoever. Toward the end of the track, there- What was the terrible shot at the weekend? I'm confused. And for no- Bitch is playing P&D in them. I'm sure he's don't listen to weekend. You know, 
I think the problem is we don't know what the beef is. So instead of just, you know, assuming um, what it is, just know that there's something there. <clears throat> anyway. No reason whatsoever. Toward the end of the track, there's also this very quiet and random interpolation of Pet Shop Boys' A uh, West End Girls, which, again, is totally coming out of left field and not even like shown off in the song in a way that is prominent or memorable. I have no idea uh, why he did it and did it so brazenly because seemingly there's no credit to Pet Shop Boys on the track. At least that's what they said on Twitter. 8 a.m. in Charlotte, I've talked about before in a review. I think it's a banger and a half, good single. I like that little part at the end. I like that little part. I don't know. It didn't need to be the whole song. I like the direct boom bat beat on the track. Drake's delivery is solid too. There's tons of standout bars on this one. Like that one about 15 years of domination. Things are bound to get kinky. I would say the only Achilles heel of this track is that it yet again shows Drake not truly knowing what he wants. Because while he raps repeatedly about uh, letting beef slide and kind of just wanting to be a more peaceful person, he's also kind of instigating beef. Not just here, but all over this record. BBL Love is loaded with some of the most ridiculous bars on the entire project, but Drake is clearly being kind of silly and just taking the piss on this one. I wouldn't take anything happening on this track too seriously, but simultaneously, if the song does expose something, it's that when Drake is being serious, he's not that much less silly and tongue-in-cheek than he's being on this cut, which makes me wonder, how seriously should we take you when you are being serious? The song Gently, featuring Bad Bunny, is just, in my opinion, completely a non-starter, as Drake sees Bad Bunny's appearance as a reason to, uh, yet again, mimic a another accent uh, in a terrible fucking fashion. I live like Sopranos, Italianos. What is he doing? Uh, it's, it's, to me, what this comes down to, bro, is that you've already heard a smash fucking hit, the song Mia, right? You've already heard it. Drake did, uh, rapped, sung in another language, that's fine. Now, though, now it's, what, what, what's, what, dude? What's wrong with this shit, bro? And again, this isn't my favorite song on, on, on the album. I, I think the song really starts at like a minute 30. So it's only a minute 30 of a song. It's too short. It could have, it could have been, it could have been longer. Uh, it it could have been longer and better. What is he doing? Does Drake know that, you know, you can just let somebody from a different country or culture rap on your track without, like, impersonating them? Like, imagine if Taylor Swift had Rosalia on a track and then just saw that as cause to be like, Yeah! A biblioteca! Rich Baby Daddy. is uh, another track on this record that, uh, despite it being kind of a hot mess, I sort of love it. It features Sexy Red, it features a Thank super you. driving, galloping, Thank danceable you. beat. Uh, SZA you. is on the track Thank too. You. And it's completely, completely unhinged. Especially with yes. Sexy Red jumping in with uh, some raunchy bars, with talking about twerking for Drake. I don't think this track is going to be for everybody, but uh, there is an outro on it that, I, frankly, at least for me, even though I liked the cut, kind of ruined it. Thank Thanks to Drake dropping no, some very moody. No, no. The dog days are over. No, no, no. That part is good, bro. That part is good. That part is good. Templative R&B style bars like a post nut clarity. I came to my senses and weird. That's fire. The fuck. Weirdly enough, there's another interpolation on this cut of uh, a Florence and the Machine song, this time credited, though, with Drake singing about how the dog days are over. Things on the tail end of this record yeah. really start to get boring with Another Late Night, where Drake throws out open threats toward anybody making, you know, Millie Bobby Brown jokes. We have a light, quirky <laughs> trap beat on this cut. It feels like the vibe of a Lil Yachty song, so of course it makes sense that Lil Yachty... Drake is ma wait, that's what you got from the song is that Drake is just making open threads for people who make Millie. B wait, hold on, bro. No, I gotta, I gotta hear that again. Open threads really start to get boring with another late night where Drake throws out open threats toward anybody making you know Millie Bobby Brown joke. <laughs> no, 
All right, bro, whatever, bro. This shit makes no sense, but whatever. We have a light, quirky trap beat on this cut. It feels like the vibe of a Lil Yachty song, so of course it makes sense that Lil Yachty is on the track. Uh, however, Lil Yachty's feature on this track is trash. My bitch know it's us without open either of her eyelids. And also, she had big tits like Billie Eilish, but she couldn't sing. Weird that Drake would put a Lil Yachty song on his record only for Lil Yachty to fuck it up. Away from home sees Drake uh, rapping in a very monotonous, repetitive fashion as he is kind of walking down memory lane, recalling all of this stuff that he had to do or go through in order to get to where he is today. And the tone of this track is just kind of confusing to me because in so many ways even though things have panned out very positively for drake he still seems like really bitter about some of the stuff that has transpired in the past some of which doesn't even seem that bad or serious or you know even if you did take it as such wouldn't these be obstacles for you to sort of like overcome or you know just stuff that you had to move through in order to get to where you are now the most confusing moment is uh, this spot where he mentions Esperanza Spalding this is such a random person to like throw a jab at for no reason and moments like this just make lines like uh, to keep it real I wasn't really gangster until now I was living on a cloud I was quiet as a mouse but like the thing is like you're saying it's for no reason but you don't know what's going on like Again, he said the thing with the weekend for no reason, but who the fuck knows, like, what what the fuck is going on, dude? Like, I, I don't know. Kind of funny, because, like, would a real gangster be going at Esperanza Spaulding's throat? No. Then the closing track, Polar Opposites, completely unnecessary. While it does tie up uh, some of the loose ends on the record in regards to, you know, this really crappy relationship that he's been singing and rapping about and uh, how toxic and divisive it's been. By that- well, I heard a lot of people saying that this album could possibly be about one relationship. Is that, did you guys get that from the album? I, I assumed it was multiple different girls. Um, but I heard, I saw us, people were saying because he mentioned that girl uh, named Haley. I don't know. What do you think? Just stop. It's not deep. Okay. Then, dude, 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 dude. What the fuck? If you're, if you just, are you one of those people that just calls things not deep? Like, I don't even, I just want to know, like, for, for those of you who take that approach, like, dude, it's not that deep, bro. What the fuck is your life, bro? Like, you can't have a conversation besides anything that goes, like, below the surface. Like, I don't understand. The same token on this cut, Drake is sort of diagnosing this girl with bipolar disorder. Does he know that that's the case? Which is kind of weird and sus. And look, I, I cannot let go of bars like, uh, you tried to grease me, but we're not in Mykonos. That is fire, bro. It's fire. Mikado's grease. What are we talking about? Like what? Why? And again, I feel like Drake has kind of dropped all pretense for bringing us any songs at this point. He's just kind of like, you know, riffing and whining through these tracks. And to be honest, this record really could have ended at 8 a.m. in Charlotte, and it would have been the better for it. Because once again with this LP, we're just getting a lot of Drake bloat. Maybe he was a bit more strategic about placing it all toward the end, but it's still there. So look, ratio of bops to flops on this thing, it is better than what we had on CLB. That for sure is true. I was happy and impressed to see Drake do as well as he did with some of these rage cuts, with some of these cuts that had more focused songwriting and went in more of an R&B direction. You have some of those classically Drake moments as well on this thing like 8am and Charlotte, but it's still not a well-groomed and consistent record and and I think Drake, unfortunately, uh, just doesn't really have the full capacity to edit himself effectively at this point, as there are so many bars and tracks just flying on this thing that don't really add to the overall vibe of the record. They weigh it down, they bog it down, or just moments that are tacky and tasteless and just straight up terrible. Drake album is going to Drake album, essentially, at the end of the day, and I'm not really sure if there's too much else to say about For All the Dogs. I'm feeling a strong five to a light six. On this one, transition. But I, 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 you know,
it, it, if this isn't enough proof, bro, that it doesn't fucking matter what Drake puts out, this dude is never gonna rate it high, bro. It, it's he's just never going to, bro. He's never going to, bro. It's just like you shouldn't even take this serious, bro. Honestly. Um, I completely disagree with the second half part after 8 a.m. shit. The only song after that that I don't really care about is Gently. All other songs... I mean, he even said Rich Baby Daddy, he loves it. Um, and then saying that Away From Home Polar Opposites you don't like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to, say to you there. Those are like Drake outro type songs where he gets kind of deep. So like, if you don't like that, I guess you could say that. But saying that it's like not good or like... It doesn't belong in the album. You, I don't know, bro. I don't. I, I. I don't know. I really. I. I don't know what to say. Um. I. I thought listening to this review, I thought he was thought he was gonna give it like a seven. That's what I thought. I thought it was gonna be a six seven. But going five, bro. You're you're calling half the album trash. You're calling half of the album trash. When we know, dude. Be subjective, Chad. You know half the album is not trash, bro. It's not, bro. It's just not. I mean, I'm not even going to argue this. I'm not even going to argue this. Even if you said half the album's mid, which it's still not, that still wouldn't give a five. You said call him? Lowe's, he gave nothing was the same a five and take care of six. He is not valid. I know this. You know this. A lot of people know this. Some people don't know this, bro. Then that's the reason I kept referencing Kendrick. Because I'm like, this dude sucks the fuck out of Kendrick. But dude, I'm going back listening to CLB. I'm going back listening to this. I'm listening to Honestly Nevermind. I'm listening to Her Loss. I'm listening to these songs. More than more than any song on that last Kendrick album, bro. Facts. Who on here? Who in here is listening to the Kendrick album, bro? Any songs on there? I'm not listening to any. And I love Kendrick. I do. And somebody said some fucking website rated this the lowest Drake album ever? Go fuck yourselves, dude. Go fuck yourselves, bro. Uh, 